Hello and welcome to The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Marina. I am very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm OK. A lot to talk about this week. Did you catch the new Gladiators? We were going to talk about some different things and then that came along yeah. and absolutely smashed the ratings for a number of different reasons. So I think maybe we're going to talk about that and, and what it means. What it means, the nostalgia, the yeah, like, Saturday like, night of it. Like we're a pair of King's College professors yes. saying, I wonder, what does Beyonce mean? <laughs> We're also going to talk about dead celebrities. George Michael's estate have registered effectively for live performance again, which means that they must be contemplating a hologram tour, and this is how it's been widely interpreted. So in the vein of Abba Voyage, but with a dead celebrity at the helm of it, we'll have a look at that. And about how much money you can make if you're dead. They do, as I say, make a great living. Um, a lot of money. Look, look at Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, what else are we going to talk about? We're also going to talk about... I read an interesting article about celebrity authors, which I felt <laughs> you would have something to say about. Yes. Um, and um, I think that the top 30 booksellers of the of 2023, the list of that has come out, so we can talk about that we'll as well. We'll combine those two. I shall look forward to that ever so much. But let's, let's start with Gladiators, shall we? Can you feel the power of the Gladiators? I mean, I certainly can. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because cause it, it was bought back. This is back. BBC One, yes. BBC One bought it back. Everyone says, oh, why are you rebooting a show? Why are you bringing back Gladiators? This is going to be awful. They're going to butcher it. Uh, and from the moment that theme tune starts, my wife Ingrid was virtually in tears with just the memory of gladiators from, from the from the original because they kept the theme tune the same they kept the format the same they kept pretty much everything the same and when the ratings came in the next day 6.4 million which i think ian highland the great tv critic said is like that's about 15 million in old money you know that's a proper big smash hit uh, and people who started watching it if you look at the ratings kept watching it i suspect they'll keep watching it next week as well so we have an enormous hit on our hands uh, and the question well let's talk about the show first because it was a lot of fun uh, and then, then we'll talk about why it was quite so successful it's presented by Bradley Walsh and his son, Barney Walsh. I'm not sure it's for Barney Walsh's presenting skills, but I suppose what they want to say is, hey, your parents loved this show, but now a new generation can also love it. So I think that whole father-son thing was a sort of nod to really what the show is in lots of ways, which is a chance for lots of people who watched it as kids and now probably have kids of their own to do the same thing. In a weird way, actually... Netflix did this once with Adam Adam Sandler. They discovered that all the people who used to go out to movie theaters to watch Adam Sandler movies now had kids and were stuck at home and watch Netflix a lot. And they, when no one else really wanted Adam Sandler and everyone was passing on his movies, put a huge investment into him because they could see that their algorithm showed that his stuff was really popular. So that kind of nostalgia, the sort of aged aged audience, yeah. has been big for this. Yeah, it really has. And the fact that, yeah, they didn't muck about with it too much. So if you're a parent, firstly, amazing to have something you can watch with your kids. To have that show and to say to your kids, oh, this is an amazing show, I promise. And for it then to be an amazing show, I think is is an incredible treat. Bradley Walsh is a fascinating one. So Bradley and Barney are a duo anyway. They do a travelogue documentary and it's got the title, which is rather a good title, Breaking Dad, which is <laughs> good. Uh, and, you know, they're a great double act on that. And... If Bradley Walsh wants to present your show, you let Bradley Walsh present your show because the British public absolutely adore him. But the presenting isn't, having said that, of this show, a whole a whole massive amount of it, really. Exactly, which and it doesn't need to be, and it isn't. They don't overplay their part too much. We get to the action pretty quickly. You know, Brad is not going, I need to sorry, I'm just gonna do a five minute monologue here. No. You know, in and out with a gag, and then you know, you're you're straight on to hang tough. But Bradley is the best paid man on British television by a mile mainly because of the extraordinary success of The Chase and Beat the Chasers and all the other variations of that. He brought that blankety blank to BBC One, which was a huge hit. I thought at the time that's a huge hit until the Gladiators numbers came in, which are a really huge hit. The documentary with Barney is absolutely massive. Whatever Bradley Walsh does turns to gold. What I do miss, though, is the sense... John Fashionu. Yeah, well, the sense that one of the presenters might have a sort of fling with what with one of the gladiators after all Rika and that it, you know that what was that goofy youngster she was hunter. hunter she was with you kind of want that because the gladiators is a sexed up auditorium i would think of it <laughs> yes it is come on it's like it's like the olympic village week 2 swimmers right you're <laughs> off competition <laughs> You're hopped up on your own glycogen, and I'm telling you, you are going to get through the IOC's supply of a thousand, twenty-five thousand free condoms. That's what. That's just what happens, okay? Didn't Grinder crash 
uh, on the first day of the 2012 Olympics. It's, it's incredible. It's, yes, um, it, it's I've, I've interviewed at various Olympics. I've gone into the Athletes' Village and interviewed quite a few um, different people about it. And it's actually, the swimmers, it's just a huge thing because, you know, they're, they're off competition for week two. Um, hold so, on, yeah. isn't, isn't your daughter six foot eight tall? And hold on, she's 11. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, we won't get sidetracked by the Athletes' Village, but I always feel that Gladiator should have been a bit like that. And according to Ulrika, it was a bit like that. Mm. Like, every, you know, I slightly wanted the sense that, you know, one of the presenters might have some, you know, maybe it'll be Mark Clattenburg because we haven't talked about someone who's resubmitting himself for national treasure status. So Mark we? Clattenburg plays the role of the referee, which was formerly played by John Anderson, who was the uh, the Scot, who was a um, contender's ready, gladiator's ready, which Mark Clattenburg does with great relish. Mark Clattenburg is a former um, Premier League and elite referee. Um, much much who brings, loved. <laughs> who brings a certain amount of baggage. I suggest that he could be an emerging villain. When he put his arm up the whistle one time, you see his, the Clattenburg body art includes the Euros trophy and the Champions League trophy, both, uh, both finals of which he has officiated in. Did he, did he win them? Yeah, well, as he always says, he tried to not make it about himself. <laughs> he he should, always honestly... used to say the players identified with him. I wonder if the gladiators identified with him. I didn't get a huge vibe of that, but... He should ha he should literally have a tattoo of a whistle. And, His book was called and... Whistleblower, of course. Oh, was it? He and... should have done the memoir after this, but... And on the other arm, some hate mail. Yeah. He used to have a, a he'd drive a BMW with a number plate CL4TTS, Clats. Did he? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean... He is really enjoying himself oh, in yeah. this, isn't he? He's absolutely Well, he's recently had it. to flee Egypt after a scandal, I suggest you Google. Uh, his attempt to bring order to a uh, match officialdom in Egypt seems to have ended with him having to leave with just a suitcase. <laughs> I strongly recommend a quick dive into that one. Um, but but it's, a, you know, it's a lovely gig for him. All he does throughout is say, contenders ready, gladiators ready, which he knows is a catchphrase already. So he's, yeah. just, he's like, I can see in his eyes... As he is saying that, he's thinking, I must be able to monetize this. Yeah. I must. I, I know I don't own the catchphrase, but I'm saying it. And he gives it everything. And he's thinking, there will be. Can I do a contenders ready, Clattenburg ready podcast? Yes. There's something or t shirts. That's what he's thinking. Again, the beauty of what they've done, Hungry Bear, who are making this reboot, who do Michael McIntyre's big show, The Wheel, lots and lots of stuff um, they do. They have cast it so brilliantly. And they haven't forgotten the lessons of the previous Gladiators, why we all loved it. They haven't kind of gone, do you know what, let's update it, let's be more, you know, knowing. Let, you know, they have got some baddies, Viper being one of them. Legend, who is absolutely my favourite, being the other one. Yeah. And they say, Legend, you've got to have respect for your opponent. And he just goes, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really liked him. He's like, he's got over a million followers on Instagram. Already? Legend. He's, no, previously. What, so yeah. what's, what, what's his pedigree, he's a, he's, he's if a, I may? He's, <laughs> what's his pedigree? If I may. Hold on, let me, look, let me check the kennel club. <laughs> uh, he is a, you know, nutritionist and bodybuilder and We've uh, created a nation coach. of this. It's our last yes. great manufacturing industry, Gym Rat. So I think it's great that we've found a sort of outlet and where to use them. But it is, and it's great to have them actually do something yes. rather than just get big. I um, noticed my children's commentary was very different. They have so many different words. It's like, oh my God, he's absolutely Brexited him. That's one of the things, you know, that's, they, they, <laughs> They say this as, you know, they're of the sort of young age of the original. I suppose they're like nine to thirteen, and they they they, were, they weren't quite sure you were allowed to do half the things. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's some there's some naughty stuff going on. Viper, I worry about a tiny bit. I, I assume there's a character arc for Viper that, that they've got all plotted <laughs> they have, out. They've even got arcs in Gladiators now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was talking to someone in comedy the other day who was saying we were asking about something in um, the thick of it, and he said, "Oh no, I'm not sure we even had arcs back then." Yeah, exactly. But now yeah. even Gladiators have arcs. Yeah, exactly. They all go all the way back to um, Noah, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, so the Gladiators are brilliantly cast. They got as they did previous times some brilliant athletes. Uh, Harry Akins, Rite is Nitro, who is. Very much yes. my he's he's the kind of you know the golden boy. He was just just kind and thoughtful and lovely, and so that's someone for the kids to get behind. And fire as well was brilliant. They got people for kids to boo. Viper Legend <laughs> is very much my favourite, but they didn't change very much about it. They had a series of games, men and women. You introduce the gladiators. There's a bit of wit in there, a bit of silliness, a, a bit of pantomime, a bit of WWE. They've got a great end game, which is, you know, the uh, the eliminator where all the points you score across the episode give you a head start. And that hasn't changed at all. It's identical. So if you're a parent watching at home, you're thinking, oh, yeah, 
I remember this. This is great. And if you're a kid watching, you're getting the same experience that your parents did when they watched it. So I think fair play to Hungry Bear for doing it so brilliantly. Fair play to the BBC for doing a reboot and doing it very, very well. And I genuinely think that terrestrial TV is having a hell of a year so far. You know, Mr. Bates versus the post office, which we talked about on last week's podcast, which is changing the world. Yep. Then the traitors and the gladiators, ideas which are just brilliantly made television and which are bringing people together and bringing people together in a way that non-linear television can't li do. Yeah, linear is not dead and it's, you know, obviously reports of its death are not only exaggerated but just completely off beam. And in fact, if you look at what lots of the streamers are going to now start trying to get into they're going to become more like TV channels. They're going to have much more stuff that is appointment to view that you want to be watching at the same time as everyone else. Or And fast, tele you know, free ad supported television is going to become much more like this. So the idea that, you know, you watch television only when you want and you don't... It, it, this event television has not gone away at all. And if anything, the streamers who had nothing to do with it are trying to find ways to get in on it. And it's very important to have something in our culture where you can call your kids into the room and you can all sit down and watch. I think it's incredibly important. And it's something that, that have been lost. It's great that people, uh, Dan Baldwin's the exec on this, but there's all sorts of brilliant people behind it, are making a show that is designed specifically for people to watch with their families and to bring people together. F from a personal point of view, the thing I like most about it is when I look at that cast, as I say, it's brilliantly cast, loads of great gladiators, all I'm thinking is, oh, a couple of those will be good for House of Games. You know, and anything, anything that widens... Can you widens... please have Venom on House of Games? No, hang on, he's not called Venom. I think that's some hangover gladiator from the previous iteration. Hangover is another of the gladiators. Hang hang I, think the he's a, I think it's Apollo. Apollo. The kind of foppy... Apollo, yes. He's a, he's looks, a, looks like he rose for Oxford. Greek god, yes, very good. Uh, yeah, he was great. Again, you think, oh, I wonder what your story's going to be. I want to see his origin story. He was bullied at public school and and now he's seeking revenge. Me too, yeah, I want, I want to have all of that. But you see, I would like it if he could have an ill-advised relationship with somebody on the presenting crew and I just don't think that's going to happen. Although rule nothing out. Rule, rule nothing listen, out. Listen, rule nothing rule out. Rule nothing out with this show. I absolutely guarantee we'll have at least one of the um, gladiators on House of Games. We're, we're filming a new batch in March. And I guarantee at least one of the gladiators uh, will be on Strictly this year as well. Well, we might talk a bit more about nostalgia in our next item, which is dead celebrities. I mean, that's the ultimate nostalgia, yeah. isn't it? Dead I mean, people. yes. The development of sort of holographic technology and things like that, based on things like the Abba Voyage, which is obviously a hugely successful kind of concert property really um george michael's estate having said not that long ago that they weren't going to get into this have now registered saying that um activity at the group will broaden in the next one to three or years to include live public <laughs> performances um and funnily enough there is a whole agency in america mark rustler he's got an agency called cmg which essentially deals with dead celebrities but and does cmg stand for corpse management group? yeah i mean it really <laughs> That's brilliant, yes. I mean, you're dealing with a certain type of person, let's yes. put it that way. He claims to manage Ingrid Bergman, Betty Davis, Billy Holiday. Wow. And to all intents and purposes, it sort of does. There is a huge, huge... This is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry a year already. Um, and it's what they're called is Delebs. That is the formal industry term for it. D-E-L-E-B-S, Delebs. And... I mean, James Dean, he made three films in his life and he does not stop working now. I can't remember. I mean, he's, he's done McDonald's advert, Christ adverts, so many adverts. Recently, not that long ago, they actually said they're making a Vietnam film in which uh, they couldn't find anyone to cast who would be as good as James Dean. So they were casting him and it became quite a big sort of bone of contention, lots of people saying this is really this is going too far and in the end it has been cancelled but it will happen um another thing that happened this week is uh a an a sort of comedian who specializes in ai dropped an ai george carlin comedy special which again has caused quite a lot of controversy and he's made it very clear that this is just his sort so of So he's AI done his material version. through George Carlin who's yeah. the, who's who's the great old he, American comedian's Can voice. I say that it falls short of does the original? It? Yes, it does. <laughs> um but who would have thought? Yes, it, uh, and something that George Carlin's daughter said, she said humans are so afraid of that she really condemned this and said humans are so afraid of the void that we can't let what has fallen into it stay there. I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. 
you know, people don't... It, it's just for money that this thing is happening. And I know that lots of people say, yes, but it's wonderful to be able to see George Michael again. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. This guy, the one I was talking about, CMG, <laughs> Courts Management Group, he licensed Martin Luther King to um, sell Dodge trucks once in a Super Bowl advert not that long ago. I oh mean, is this goodness. what Martin Luther King would have wanted? Certainly not what one of the daughters thought he would have wanted. Wow. But I have a dream. Off-road yeah. utility. Yeah. <laughs> Side impact bars as standard. I'm I'm all for these. I'm all for people being allowed to stay dead. And obviously, Star Wars have done it. We've had you've had Peter Cushing with sort of revived for Rogue One, and I think one of the later ones, Carrie Fisher. Uh, Carrie Fisher, obviously. Yeah. Um, and you're going to see it more and more. It was a big, big bone of contention in the SAG after the Screen Actors Guild strike, which is you know actors feel that AI is a sort of existential threat to them and I think that the deal they got I can see why lots of them aren't even happy and they do feel that soon sooner rather than later they their images will be used in this way there's also old celebrities are approached by these groups mm. and sign perhaps elderly and infirm sign away their future rights while they're still alive for a, a sum now and I think that they're I think it's a very I think it's a very complicated area but it's an increasingly lucrative one and it's happening more and more in music as well um you know Dylan sold his catalog for 400 million mm. uh Bowie after his death his catalog was sold for 250 million you know so the huge amount of money in it uh Elvis still makes over a hundred million dollars yeah. every year. He's normally year. the top. And this year will be a big year. But um, you know what? Always from Graceland. Graceland yes. is where he makes almost all his money. Yeah. The theme park and the merchandise. Yes. It's literally his house is. Uh, he's like a. And he's, it's not that enormous. Yeah, he's it's... like a North London couple who bought in the eighties. Yeah. His his house is making him all his money. So, he, but even Jeff Bacara, who was the drummer from Toto. He sold his publishing rights. He passed away many years mm. ago, but his publishing rights were sold for $25 million. There's an awful lot of money in old music. But going back to ABBA Voyage for a moment, have, have you seen it? Yes, I have. I mean, I thought it was magnificent. It felt like an entirely it's, different form of art. Yes, it, it, exactly. But I think that that's a... That is separate, I think, to some of these things, which is just trying to sort of monetize the the dead person. I think they, you know, they collaborated on it. They had this idea. They didn't want to be old on stage. All sorts of things. But I don't think it's the same as sort of reviving people in this way, often without their consent. Simon Fuller said he came up with the idea for um, Voice. He's not he's not involved in it, but I, I know he had early discussions when he saw the two pack hologram, and thought, hold on a minute. Um, I think that when you go and see that ABBA thing. I was talking to my brother, my brother. My brother has an interesting view. He says, you know, when we think about Mozart and Beethoven, that's the canon of classical music. We don't need to see Beethoven and Mozart play it. I agree. You know, just any anyone can do it. And he said, look, the music of the, you know, 60s and 70s and 80s is canon now, and it's going to be around forever and ever and ever. And so if I'm George Michael's estate, and who clearly love him a great deal, I think it's people would like to see George Michael do a show like Voyage because it's a triumphant show. And so why not, in a way? And, of course, if you're Queen and if you're um, Elton John, then, of course, you're currently being digitised. I mean, that ABBA thing, I think they spent £140 million setting it up and it's already paid all of that back and it's making, you know, two million quid a week just in London and it's going to go to Vegas and it's going to go to Singapore and it's going to go to Sydney and it's going to go all over the world. And it's going to make millions and millions and millions forever in a way that people are going to enjoy. So there's something to be said for that. Uh, and if you can send George Michael around the world, I mean, we miss him and it would be lovely to have had more of him. But to send George Michael around the world and to, and to, and to let him sing for fans again, I think I don't mind it. I think there's I think something, something okay. in our culture that can't, just can't handle the end of things in this way. I think that it's really significant to me that in Marvel movies, They've sort of almost invented the multiverse or any character can come back to life, really. And they've done that. And as a result, people are just not used to... They can't really deal with endings. There's sort of beginnings, middles, new beginnings. And there are no stakes in the same way because if you remove the idea of death as final and things like that, then you, what you're removing, in, it, to a large extent, is the, the kind of greater stakes in types of drama and things like that. I think it's rooted in a kind of really... Something quite infantilised and quite unable to deal with endings in our culture. And, I, and as your brother says, the music lives on, but the idea of having to sort of confect the idea that the person can still deliver it to us seems to me quite problematic and something that, 
you know, it's almost been thrown as a sop to people who can't deal with things. There's also another thing, which is if you're a producer or an executive, the hardest thing to deal with is the talent, right? And yes. The one thing about dead talent is they're easy to deal with. I bet this guy loves his, his books. He's, he's got the easiest client book. Occasionally you get someone like Michael Jackson, you're thinking, all oh, right, well, that makes things a little bit difficult. But Yeah, but he's not getting yeah, he's not getting five calls a week from Ingrid Bergman. No. She, she's, yeah, no, I bet she didn't like where she got sat at the uh, the awards. Anything. None <laughs> exactly. of that. You're not having any of this. She's been airbrushed they're incorrectly. They're the easiest in clients there. in the world. His book of the dead. He can <laughs> go around. So, and... You know, I, I, so I absolutely, you know, I, I absolutely... Uh, get it he was, uh, he's got Maya Angelou who's, who he's made do a Google advert is that what she would have wanted Richard no. it, would Maya Angelou yes Maya Angelou Amelia Earhart she loves the tech companies supposedly she's done Google she's done Apple Einstein's doing pretty yeah, scarce I'm isn't doing... he <laughs> and you know you've, I, you slightly think with these people how, she refers and he refers on the website to Maya Angelou and Mark Twain as literary influencers which already <laughs> had I mean... me reaching for you know, my strangulation devices. Um, and I, I I just sort of, on what basis can he think that Maya Angelou would want to advertise Google? And on what basis is he allowed to do that? And also what it means is that the fans who might wish to depict their fallen idols in any kind of way are actually at the mercy of really aggressive entertainment lawyers who say, no, well, hang on, we own the rights to that. You can't do that. You can't make a tribute. The, the, some of the King family, or some of the King family estate, rather, have charged millions of dollars for having statues put up to him, but were happy to licence um, for the Dodge commercial, whereas other members of the family are really against it. But I have to say, I don't think it's a positive thing. Once you know that um, Kiss, the, the rock band Kiss, are of course doing a holographic tour. Of course they are. The most shameless monetizers in the whole, almost, I think probably in rock history, I don't think there's any, but they even had a coffin, a Kiss branded coffin once, the Kiss casket. Wow. Yeah. Gene Simmons said, uh, I love living, but this makes the alternative look pretty damn good. Oh, that's I'm sure good. after his own death, he'll have sewn it up so that no one will be able to make any more money. He'll have got the last penny while he's still alive. But perhaps know, that's but what we should order. You can't take it with you. All I'm hearing, though, is that Kiss are going to do a, a hologram concert, which, which, which I'm you're going to go to. Absolutely, of course, of course <laughs> I am. I'm absolutely fully uh, in favour of it. But then there's people like... Um, I was just looking through the list of the richest dead celebrities. Michael Jackson, top of the list because mm. of the because of the musical, which I forget, which is not a hologram thing. It's just yep. it's just his songs. Arnold Palmer still makes ten million dollars a year. Does he? The golfer, yep. yeah, for, just from his iced tea, you know, which is like half iced tea, half lemonade, is an Arnold Palmer, and he makes that. And now they're making alcoholic Arnold Palmer iced tea, which means he'll probably double his income next year. Yeah, um, I should but, think at least treble. Surely. You know. If you are George Michael's family, then I trust you to look after his best interests and I trust you to have an instinct as to what he would want. The problem is, as you say, a lot of the time there comes a point where a company will buy out your rights. There's a company called Primary Wave who own um, Prince, Ray Manzarek. They just yeah. paid $80 million as well. So there comes a point where they will buy you out and they will, they'll leave it a couple of years just you know, for decorum and then they can literally do what they want. I thought it a bit in, in books with, with Harper Lee when they bought out Ghost Set of Watchmen, which is that sort of prequel to, yeah. to Killer Mockingbird and sold like absolute gangbusters, you know, made a lot of money for everyone. But, but it was not great for her reputation I don't think I don't think it did her memory any favors, and I think the big thing is going to be movies where you're going to be able to have Robert De Niro and Clint Eastwood in movies for the next fifty, sixty, seventy years. You know, you're going to be able to have whoever you want in any movie you want. I was talking to someone who said you can put yourself in these, you can put yourself in Back to the Future. However, gently, gently, they're pushing things at the moment. Just bit by bit, they're going to put their foot in the door, and there's going to be people in films who don't really exist, and there's going to be people in well, films who weren't there. This is why they got the, the deal. They yeah, got yeah. the they got the deal. The actors and the writers got the deals in the big two big strikes that happened last summer. Um, on uh, a, a big part of which of both strikes was AI. They got the deals because it's just not quite good enough yet for the studios to be using it. But believe me, as soon as it is, you'll have to be back at that table and you won't be getting anything like that deal anymore. I think it's really, really tough. Shall we take a break? Let's take a break. Welcome back. We've just been Googling uh, Apollo during the break, the gladiator, and he did go to a minor public school. He went to school in Barnard Castle, Richard, which hopefully he will su supersede Barnard Castle as the reason for which we will currently know it to be famous. I just I used to love the Barnard Castle days, where it was the easiest gag in the world. Anytime anything like that was mentioned, yeah. 
We are now going to talk about celebrity authors because I've read I read an article this weekend, a big article about celebrity authors. First of all, the the list of the most um, popular thirty authors of twenty twenty three came out. Richard, you are extremely near the top of it. I hope you already know this. Um, but um, also, there was an article about celebrity authors and whether they're a sort of bad thing in general for publishing. Um, and I pretty sure you'll want to make a distinction between children's celebrity authors and adult celebrity authors. Uh, hit me with your knowledge on this because I'm not quite sure what I feel. I noticed you were quoted extensively in the article, which, you know, I and I agreed with all the things you said. But in general, I slightly do feel that sort of thing that a lot of people feel, particularly in the children's writing space, which is that book deals given to celebrities um, to write children's books and they haven't really shown any other previous interest in writing at all and it becomes an extension of the brand it's just another thing they do they might have a fashion line they might have a series of children's books it's keeping other or, pot or potential authors off the shelves yeah I mean people tend not to lump me in I think people understand that you know that I've always been a writer and that you know I've I wrote the book without telling on I was doing it and all that you know I didn't go out looking for a I book knew deal. you would have done that I no I there's very few authors on this top 30 list that I've read but you were one of them but I don't think of you as in the same space as quite a lot of these other ones who e.g. used to be in McFly and the article if you want to have a go at Tom Fletcher you come through me I okay <laughs> if any if any member of McFly if you have a problem with any of them you've got a problem with me anyway we'll, we will move on to McFly in another episode I'm sure they're lovely I haven't read the books. If you've not read, read the, the dinosaur that pooped lists. Christmas. Now, there's a there's a distinction made in the article which is a, it's a really good article by John Self uh, which is a pseudonym I think uh, in the Guardian. And there are some celebrity authors of course you know I put myself on that list Bob Mortimer, Dawn French who are writers. Yes. And Graham Norton, Ruth Jones. And if you're a writer at some point you're going to write a novel. I mean, you just are because yeah. you're a writer and you get to the stage in life where you've got a bit more time on your hands. You've got hopefully a few more things in your head that you want to say. So you write a novel and you do it yourself and you give it to a publisher and they read it and they go, this is a good novel. We're going to publish it. There's obviously an advantage in having a, a public profile when you go to promote it, but there's not an advantage when you're trying to sell it. You have to write the book. And I, mean, I have to say that, public, you know, in a pretty atomised culture, publishing is an industry like anything else and it has to survive and bringing in people who have followings already is a way of uh, of making that happen and it doesn't necessarily mean if people come through the door of a bookshop that they're going to choose those books but those names might get people through the door through the door uh there's on the other extreme there's a group of people Shirley Ballas is a good example the Strictly Judge who are very open about using a ghostwriter about going and saying like I've got an idea for a novel I'm I'm not going to write it, but I would love it to be written. You know, who credit their ghostwriter, who talk about it incredibly openly. The book comes out, the public can work out whether they want to buy that and read that or not on the strength of the story and all of those things. Now, the interesting bit in the article and the interesting bit in the industry is there is a middle ground of celebrities who have written books that they haven't really written uh, and who don't really admit to it. The clues are all there. Everyone in the industry knows, by the way, because any time a celebrity is pitched to you, they need a ghostwriter and they come to agents for the ghostwriter. So people um, know what's going on there. Now, I'm happy that there's a world in which Bob Mortimer and Ruth Jones are writing novels because they write great novels and Dawn French. You know, they. I grew up... I'd loved, They're writers. They're writers. I loved the novels of Ben Elton when I was, yeah. you know, back, back in the day. You know, it's... Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie wrote an amazing novel called The Gunsetter, which, which he, he never followed so up. He's so good. He's so good at everything. And he if he just said, I hated doing it so much, I'm never going to do it again. He actually, I think he's really good at music, obviously. Yeah. He's fantastic. He's obviously brilliant at acting. I mean, he is he a wrote, real... He wrote for Oxford, didn't he? Or at Cambridge, Cambridge one I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cambridge, yeah. He could have been a gladiator. Yeah. <laughs> called, called Worcester. Yeah. So I think that there are going to be celebrities who write novels, and if you read those novels and you don't like the first one, you're not going to read the second one, you're not going to read the third one. And so, you know, that's always going to be part of the industry and that's going to make money for the industry. But, you know, the reason Hugh Laurie didn't write another one is it's really hard. Like, yes. it's it's so painful and so difficult creatively. Listen, there's much harder jobs, but creatively it's one of the but hardest. But it's not as you're, if you're just having some lame idea and getting a ghostwriter to do it. And I really object to that. I think that's taking work and shelf space from people who are far, far more talented. And just because you're a good judge on a reality show or something like that, why on earth should you have this other thing? If you can't do it yourself, I'm fine, have a memoir. 
and someone will ghostwrite that and I hope you acknowledge them when you do it. But I just think it, it's it's genuinely dreadful and I just think it makes the market more and more sort of moronic, really. I think it just lowers the, lowers the tone, lowers the intellectual standard, lowers... If you don't have people, artists creating their own work and, and lying about it effectively. I actually think it pushes the culture down into the mire and I think some of the stuff on the shelves is real rubbish and there's no need for it to be there and I think publishers should stop doing it. Well, this is what I think. There's been a series of, you know, my world is, is, is crime and thriller and there's been a series of celebrity written crime and thriller things this year and it's really hard to write those books and there are people there who have not written their books. Now, the irony is they're not sending any copies. They haven't been hits. So I would say to people in publishing, if people are listening, one hopes they are, if you currently have a deal on your desk where an agent has come to you with a, with a celebrity or you've gone to an agent and said, could they write a crime book or could they write, you know, whatever it is you want them to write, don't do it. If you're going to pay them £100,000, take that £100,000, split it into three and give it to three people who are great young writers who need money to write a novel, who want to give up the day job for a bit to write a novel, just do that. Absolutely guarantee you you're more likely to have a, a real hit book if you do that. Chasing this ridiculous thing of celebrity is absurd, and you paid a fortune for it. You yeah. paid a fortune for it because it sounds good in a meeting. And don't allow yourself be de- to be treated as some kind of brand extension. Just have a bit of self-respect. I mean, I'm, there's certain people on this list that I think, you know, I'm not quite sure, having looked at the earlier children's, but why Jerry Halliwell has been given any another another book deal. I mean, I loved her in The Spice Girls, but she's now a sort of bit part in Drive to Survive and doing very well. She doesn't need this. Jamie Oliver, who has spent a couple of decades saying to everybody, I've never even read a book, has now written one. And I'm not sure that it, it, taking away from somebody else, he's got he's got a huge sort of multi-format brat, lifestyle brand, all sorts of different things. Does he need the books as well? And do they really need to be part of it? I, I really think there is a limited amount of shelf space, marketing budget, all those sorts of things, and it should go to younger people because in the end, your industry will eat itself if you keep doing that. That's exactly right. And, you know, as you say, listen, the, the, the list of the, the top-selling authors last year came out. So, well, J.K. Rowling is number three. Yeah. Uh, she wasn't a celebrity. She just sat no. down and worked her ass off and wrote the first book and sold it. And Julia know, Donaldson's number one. Julia Donaldson yeah. is number one, the children's author, yeah. which is great. I mean, yeah. she's got 400 books and they all yeah. keep selling year after year after year after year. Colleen Hoover is number four. Now, Colleen Hoover was a care worker in America who self-published online, got a little bit of traction from that, got a little bit more traction, sold it to a to a, a, a physical book publisher and is now the best-selling author in the whole world. And, you know, darling of TikTok and it's all, all of these I've things. Never, I mean, I don't, really, I don't really read books like this. It's an awful thing to um, say. Jeff Kinney, who does uh, um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, is mm. number seven. He was a cartoonist who did his stuff online, yeah. did web stuff. And again, people, just a couple of people started picking up on it and then he became one of the biggest authors in the world. Lee Child is number eight. Yeah. Lee, he, was sacked, he was sacked from a job in television. Uh, sounds familiar. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, said, said well, I'm going to write the Reacher novels and did it. Almost everybody on this list, if you go down uh, the list, Bonnie Garmer yeah. wrote, wrote her first book in the 60s, and Lessons it's an in um, Chemistry. The, Lessons in Chemistry is an unbelievable phenomenon. It's already been made into a TV um, limited series in the adult space in the in the top thirty. There's not. I mean, I, I'm on it. I, I have to. And that's the elephant in the room. But you know, I hope that uh, you know I've proved myself over over four books that I'm I'm a I'm an author. But there aren't any others in there. There aren't any others in there. What are on the list are a huge series of people who sat at home, wrote something, thinking no one's going to read it, and then got picked up and that's where most hits come from Gabriella yeah. Zevany wrote Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow so 10th novel and that's a worldwide smash so there's lots of articles about celebrity authors and stuff like that so to publishers I would say stop doing the ones that are ghost written or put that ghostwriter's name on the cover it's outrageous and it, the, it, the whole industry knows it all the other authors know yeah. whose stuff is ghost written everybody does and it's you a, slag it off at the festivals of course Good. because well because Right, it's really hard to write, and yeah. writers talk about they're in the middle yeah. of a job, and you get someone swanning in who just think, "Oh, you, 
you don't appear troubled by the creative process particularly, do you? And so, of course, you slag them off. So publishers stop doing it. As you say, I, th I think it. I think it brings us down as a culture if people are pretending they've written a book when Just they haven't written a book. Just not crediting writers for their work Doesn't, always, wherever it yeah. happens, is something that should 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 no longer occur. Doesn't work for everyone, but I think that listen, the main takeaway is I beat J.K. Rowling. That's the main takeaway. But I got beaten by Julia Donaldson, so that's uh, that's a nice position to be in. I would say <laughs> I wouldn't want to beat Julia Donaldson. Can you imagine? I'd be you, the Grinch. You, you're gonna, you'll have to write quite a few more if you're going <laughs> to have that many <laughs> exactly. in circulation. Um, should we do a couple of recommendations? I want to recommend yes. something. Um, it's a two-part documentary about a, a crime in Australia called Last Stop Larimer. And it's a little town um, on one of the kind of uh, highways right in the middle of America in the outback. It's got 11 residents and there's a murder. And it's a documentary made by the Duplass brothers. And it's so brilliant we talked on, on the question and answer thing about when is it okay to do true crime stuff and when is it exploitative. Yeah. And this, I think, is the absolute perfect example of when it's okay because it's such an incredible portrait of a way of life and of a group of people and of human nature and it's told in such a beautiful way. Uh, but at the same time, there, there's a crime at the heart of it and there's extraordinary, extraordinary God, how extraordinary a population characters. of that size. Yeah, of Funnily enough, people. I was talking to someone the other day who was explaining to me about a place she went to in Alaska. Um, it's a city, it qualifies as a city by their standards. There are 48 residents and 17 of them are on the local council and it changes all the time. Wow. I just thought, well, I mean, that not not hopefully not such a tragedy, but I thought that is a real sitcom. <laughs> God, oh God, isn't it just? Yeah, on, yeah. on, on governance. Just, yeah. So, so if you last stop Larry Mode, really, really recommend it. What's it's that a, on? It's on Netflix and it's unlike anything I've seen before. And by, you, you, you absolutely get sucked in. You have opinions on every single person who appears on screen, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, speaking of which, in the, not, in the fictional space, I have been, I finished something called The Curse, which is on Paramount+. Plus. I'm sorry, that might not be everybody's streaming service. However, it's got um, Emma Stone and the brilliant Nathan Fielder, the comedian who wrote it with this, uh, with Benny Safdie, um, who's also in it. Um, and it is, I mean, it's a real Marmite show. I talked talk to a lot of people, some people who just really couldn't get along with it but Emma Stone is totally fantastic I'm going to go and see her in Poor Things this afternoon and I I can't recommend I think it's very odd and it's really worth having a look at it's just a very odd way of making comedy um, and oh, it's I, a comedy I, it's a, oh it's a comedy okay. yeah but it's sort of comedy of excruciation and cringe and you know fake documentary and um, but it's unusual and it, it becomes something weirder um, but I'll, I won't say any more than that. But anyway, it's called The Curse and it's screening in the UK on Paramount+. Plus. So The Curse and Last Stop Larimer. Um, we're going to do another question and answer session uh, coming out on Thursday, yes. is that right? Very good. All your questions are so good. Do please keep them coming at the rest is entertainment at gmail.com. There's some great questions this yeah. week as well. There's so many. We're going to have to get round to them all eventually because they're, they're all of very high quality. So gladiators, dead celebrities and ghost written books. That was a lot of fun. Um, we'll uh, see you all on Thursday. See you then.